Okay, so um, beyond expectations and better than average, who doesn't want to be like that? Um, so to start off with an artist, Pablo Picasso, computers are useless, they only give you answers. And this is largely true, even as I'm a computer scientist. Um, what's interesting is uh, problems. And that's what I'm gonna talk a bit about, about the sort of problems that I want to work on uh, whilst I'm here. Obviously, it's only indicative. I'm trying to give you a flavor of the kind of work that I'm going to do. And of course, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of technical details, but there's enough maths in there to keep the math nerds happy. Um, this is Vladimir Vatnik. I took this photograph in uh, Tübingen about six or seven years ago, and what he's holding in his hand is the empirical risk minimization principle. This is the foundation of most of machine learning. Certainly, the theory of machine learning uh, looks at it that way. And uh, more uh, spelling it out in a little more detail, what you do in an abstracted machine learning problem is this formula, right? The argmin of the expected value of the loss between your labels and your predictions of the labels. X are your features, H is your hypothesis, Y is your target, L measures the difference, and you wanna make that small on average. The world gives us the random variables, the loss function is somehow magically given to us, and the goal is to minimize that expected value, right? You're minimizing that indexed family of random variables that are written down the bottom there. That's too hard. So you lower your sights and you don't try and do it over all functions, but over that model class H on the left-hand side, and even that's too hard, and you replace the expectation by a sum. And the vast majority of the ML literature focuses on H. Like you go to Europe, that's what people are talking about, different choices for H and mechanical procedures for finding the argument. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying L, the loss function. There's a surprising amount to say, none of which I will say today. But what about E, right? On that left-hand equation, what about E? Why do we choose that and is the choice justified? So let's just remind ourselves of the basic idea of expectation. Um, so you end up with, uh, for each choice of um, uh, hypo hypothesis, you've got, um, it's just showing bright. So you, you, you end up, for each data point, you have, uh, you choose a particular hypothesis and what I'm plotting are the values of the, that random variable R. And then you optimize over H, you change different H's, and things change. So what's happened to my screen? So there's some glitch, oh, there we go. Um, and eventually your algorithm converges and you choose H5, right? And why did you choose that? Because kind of on average, these numbers are smaller. Smaller is better, loss is bad, right? That's what you're trying to do. So just keep that visualization in mind. Now, if X and Y represent or matter to actual people, and you go and do this uh, calculation, which is increasingly becoming the case, then quite reasonably, we are asked to explain or justify the results of a machine learning based decision. And there's this whole field of explainable machine learning uh, that, that, that grapples with that. And there's a huge amount of effort um, put into justifying the H right, looking inside the model class and all of your choices there, or justifying how you chose what you chose, that is essentially justifying the argument. But I reckon justification of the E is also called for, and I'm not actually alone in that. So this famous book by Ian Hacking on the emergence of probability um, says the same, even today justification is called for, and you can go and you know, read the, the whole thing. I should say, I rely on my slides that people can read about five times faster than I can talk, so I'm not going to go and spell everything out. But the point here is that, no, you should not take for granted that expectation is the way that you should turn that big sequence of numbers into a single number. Now, I'm focusing upon expectation, but I could have couched the whole discussion so far in terms of probability. Because, as I'm sure most of you know, I can take either of them as a primitive. I can say on the right hand side, the normal thing, probability is a primitive, satisfies certain axioms, and then I define expectation in the bottom right. But equally, as Peter Whittle did in his book, I can take expectation as a primitive, and then of course you define probability as the indicator of a set function. 
So there's no really big deal. It depends on an aesthetic choice. My aesthetics lean to expectation and I can argue why that is the case. What is the normal justification of E? Well, it goes back a long time to a politician, in fact. I didn't realise this, but Emile Borel, as well as being a famous mathematician, ended up being a minister in the French government. So goes to show it can happen to the best of us. Um, <laughs> but uh, he is famous for developing the law of large numbers, in particular the strong law. And in caricature form, it says this. Remember, I'm glossing details. You suppose that the, you have a sequence of independently identically distributed random variables with a Bernoulli distribution, coin flips, right? With probability of heads P. And then you sum up the number of heads that you get, our heads are one, tails are zero, and you get this Sn, and then you take the limit of that divided by N as N goes to infinity, and the probability that that equals this magical P, the little P, the probability that that occurs is one. That's one way of stating the strong law of large numbers. It justifies um, the use of the expectation. There's another interesting way to think about what this statement says, um, which is kind of cool. So instead, let little x denote the number whose binary expansion is zero dot x1, x2, x3, etc. So x1, x2, x3, they are either zero or one, right? So that just gives me a binary decimal. I know that sounds stupid, but I don't know how else you can say it, right? It's a binary number with a dot in front of it which means, of course, it's a number between zero and one. So the other um, way of thinking of what the strong law of large numbers says is if you now impose the Lebesgue measure, just a uniform measure on the unit interval, and then you go and ask, what is the measure, the, the volume or area of those numbers for which the sequence of relative frequencies does not converge? And that volume is zero. Right, that's what the second bullet point says. And this is very plausible. I mean, the way you would normally explain this to an undergraduate is that, well, there's many more sequences that do converge. And you know, the simple argument is take p equals a half, you've got a fair coin, use the binomial coefficients and just count, right? There's just lots more sequences where the number of heads and tails balance out, right? I mean, if you've got a length one million sequence and you've only got one head, there's only a million ways you could do that but there's a stupendous number that gives you some kind of balance. So in other words, the size of the set where convergence fails is very small, and so we can neglect it. That's the idea. Now, there's other ways you can measure the size of an infinite set, right? So things that are infinite are tricky to understand. And so um, uh, if you've never met these terms before, I really, you won't fully grok what I'm going to say in the next slide or two, but if you've seen them before, it might uh, it might make sense. So you rely on this notion of a topology, right? It's a way of imposing a structure on a on a set, um, and uh, you say that you know a subset is dense if it has a non-empty intersection with each empty non-empty open set in the topology, and then you can define the notion of a set that is nowhere dense, right? As I've written there. And the set is meager if it's a denumerable union of nowhere dense sets. Now, just the English words here already should give you the intuition. So I've defined a notion of a very small set, right? A very small subset of an infinite set, right? So that's, that's what this notion of meager means. And so with this, right, we can actually repeal the law of large numbers, um, which is kind of cool, right? That's, dangerous to call your result a law. Um, and so what you do is you, you pick a particular topology. Look, this detail, it's a technicality. Um, and now let's, let's denote L a half, the set of all binary sequences with limiting relative frequency one half, they're the fair points. The strong law of large numbers says that the Lebesgue measure of that set is one. So this is a very large subset, right? Most, frequent, most sequences, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that you want, the law of large numbers actually holds. This alternative view, which I first came across in this, this, this book by Oxtoby, says that um, this very same set is meager in the particular topology. So the same set is really, really big if you use Lebesgue measure, and that very same set is really, really small if you use this topological notion. 
It's weird, right? And it shows you the kind of complications you get when you start reasoning about infinite sets. Now, I think the wrong response to this is to say, well, which is, what should I use, right? Um, to me, what this tells you is that, huh, there's a choice, and we should investigate that um, a lot further. Um, so let's think through the implications um, of this. So it gives us pause, right? It makes us think, well, actually, so far, I've just been talking about maths, right? But the whole point of these mathematical theorems is to give you some uh, faith that your mathematical calculations are applicable to the world. You would like that the, the data that you measure uh, satisfies the requirements of the law of large numbers. Now we have a doubt, right? So if you think about this carefully, the, the, the Borel law only um, holds if the sequences that you see in the world were drawn according to that Lebesgue measure, right? But there is no reason to believe that that is the case. None, none whatsoever. It's very misleading when, you know, this, the way this is normally described is that, you know, things converge almost surely. And you think, oh, if I'm almost sure, I'm just gonna call that sure, right? But almost sure is just English words for the mathematical statement about the vague measure. So we now have a down, our world starts to crumble. This thing that we relied upon for all of our machine learning, we think, Maybe um, uh, it's, it's not so certain after all. And Burrell recognized this himself. So in this popular book he wrote, um, Probability and Certainty, he talks about situations on real measurements where the limiting value does not converge. So he recognized this. So the guy who's credited with the law on which the choice of expectation is made himself has a doubt. So you might think, well, boy, does this undermine all the probability? Is everything that we're doing wrong? No, but let's think what it does say. So look at this interesting quote, which I will read out. In everyday language, we call random these phenomena where we cannot find a regularity allowing us to predict precisely their results. Generally speaking, there's no ground to believe that a random phenomena should possess any definite probability. No ground to believe. Therefore, we should have distinguished between randomness proper, as an absence of regularity, and stochastic randomness, which is the subject of probability theory. So this is an interesting statement. It's more compelling when you see who said it, right? This is Andrei Kolmogorov, the fellow who axiomatized probability theory in 1933. And this is what he said in 1982. It had been bugging him for 50 years, right? And towards the end of his life, he sort of recognized it and wrote this down in a paper. It was the opening um, uh, paragraph of the paper. So at one level, it undermines probability theory's claim for universality, for being the only theory of uncertainty you need. But it turns out, and here I can only wave my arms and sketch the notion, the somewhat grander theory that you need for this non-stochastic randomness is a strict generalization of probability theory. So it's not like you have to chuck probability theory out, it's that you have to generalize it, right? And that's, that's kind of my agenda to, to explore that. And I'm not the first person to observe this, as you'll see from the, the pointers to the literature that I'll give you. This recognition that um, your relative frequencies of actual measurements of things in the world might not converge have been recognized for a long time. So I don't know if anyone recognizes this guy, but by the clothing and the, the hairdo, you can tell that it was some time ago, right? So this is John Venn, who you must have heard of with Venn diagrams, um, but he also wrote this book, right? And in the old, you know, 19th century form of title pages is this long-winded thing here. And the thing I'm quoting in the top left, he shows that, um, you know, sometimes the relative frequencies will not converge, but they'll fluctuate in a way, right? Um, and so what you won't get is the nice convergence that you get in these idealized situations. Like I pointed out, if you noticed, when I mentioned Ian Hacking's book, I forgot to say that, you know, probability theory was developed historically motivated by trying to explain games of chance, 
So no woman could work out how they could you know, make money in their betting, right? Now, the whole point of a game of chance is you set up the chance mechanism to be truly stochastically random in the Kolmogorov sense. That's what he's alluding to here. Um, and note the quote that I just highlighted there. I'll come back to that on the right hand side. So real data differs from games of chance. Um, so I agree with Ben's first point. His second point though, quoted at the bottom, I disagree with though, right? And I think he's, he's led astray here because he says that, yeah, sure, things won't converge, but we're still gonna go and take averages because um, it's the only certain arithmetical way of, of, of proceeding. I mean, he's basically thinking, well, if you're not gonna take the average, what are you going to take? So digging deeper, what's the root of the problem? So I was talking about expectations. Um, you get the same problem um, if we switch back to talking in terms of probability, which I argued is equivalent. So this is Bruno Di Finetti, and he, a famous Italian probabilist, and he opened his book on probability theory with the rather strange opening sentence, probability does not exist, right? That's his opening line, right? And then there's like 500 pages on this topic that does not exist. And what he meant was that it does not exist out there. It's not a thing in the world, it's all inside your head. That's his conclusion, right? And there's, as many of you would know, there's a whole bunch of people now that would uh, claim that that is the way probability theory works. It's intrinsically subjective. I claim that he almost got it right. And if instead he had said the, probability does not exist, I totally agree with him. And this does not justify subjectivism. It merely says that one needs to declare one's reference class. I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that later on. And accept that there is no unique number. And just to give you a hint of, you know, the kind of example you should keep in mind here, you think about insurance, right? You want to insure your car, it'll cost you a thousand dollars. Oh, you're um, 30 years old. Well, actually, you're cheaper. You're, it's only $700. Oh, but you've actually had 17 accidents before. I'm sorry, it's $2,000. So depending upon the reference class that you're in, you will get different prices for insurance. So this point I'm making, I think it demands reiteration. Um, uh, the machine learning community hasn't quite grappled it. They're kind of sniffing around it. You see whole books on this notion of data set shift right? Which the way that's defined is that, you know, the, 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 the distribution of the training data is different to the distribution of the test data. Now, that, another way of saying that is that things didn't actually converge, right? It's a funny notion of convergence when you say that, oh, well, it did converge, but then later on it converged to another point. That's not convergence, right? But that's the way the community has grappled with it because the expectation uh, is that uh, things do converge. Um, and I remind you what Kamogorov said, there is no ground to believe that a random phenomenon should possess any definite probability. Here's David Aldous, a contemporary famous statistician at Berkeley, um, who couches it this way about what one should do. In what, he asks, in what real world context is it both practical and useful to attempt to estimate numerical probabilities? Implicit in that statement is the realization that it doesn't always work. And so then the meta question is, well, when does it work? And what should you then do? So just one other reiteration back to the beginning with the empirical risk minimization principle. I had these things, these random variables, right? I've been talking about probability. Um, you know, the, the normal way you present this stuff is in terms of random variables, these X's and Y's. And it's a very annoying name. If you've ever had to teach this, you realize it's, 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 it's a lousy name because they're not random, but they're functions from a sample space and they don't vary. I mean, it's really hard to think of a dumber name, right? <laughs> I mean, apart from that, it's a really good name, right? But, um, uh, and interpreting random and variable is remarkably hard. So we're gonna talk about random in a few slides time. But even variable is a very vexed notion. Bertrand Russell, right, who's probably one of the most famous people working on the foundations of mathematics, reckoned it was one of the most difficult to understand notions in mathematics. It's something that everyone takes for granted, but it's remarkably difficult. Karl Menger managed to write two whole papers on the subject. It's kind of astonishing that you could go and do that. So what is a random variable? 
right? We still don't know. And as in a slightly snarky aside, you know, you could, if you want, go and check what the deep learning researchers tell you. And in this famous book, there's the definition there, a random variable is a variable that can take on different values randomly. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't really help. So we, 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 can, um, we can dispense with that. Um, but the thing is, we have this formal mathematical notion of probability due to Kolmogorov. Surely the answer is known. So what does he have to say? In particular, what does he have to say about the use of this notion applied to data in the world, not just as a piece of pure mathematics? So in his book, The Foundations of the Theory of Probability, originally written in 1933, translated into English later on, there's a footnote all right, where he says, look, if you're just interested in the maths, you can skip this section because it's just maths. And that's absolutely true if that's all you're interested in. But if you're interested in the application of probability theory to the world, um, then uh, you should pay attention, like he did, to the work of Richard von Mises. Right? So who is this fellow? Richard von Mises. So von Mises was, through some weird time travel thing, inspired by this XKC, XKCD cartoon, right? So here's the two characters. There's lightning around. You see a lot of the lightning arresters here in Tübingen. It's obviously a real problem. And the fellow says that it's okay. Lightning only kills 45 Americans per year. So the chances of dying are only one in 7 million. We're fine, okay? And the punchline is the annual death rate among people who know that statistic is one in six, right? So it's a nice joke, but it, it, what it tells you is that it all depends upon your reference class, right? Now, one in six is probably not, as, it's probably not that bad, but the point is it depends upon how you select it. Are you taking all of the people in the country or are you just taking the people who think that they know something about it? And you're going to get a different answer. So what von Mises wanted to do was um, essentially it's the difference between a mathematical theory and a scientific theory. You can develop a mathematical theory and you live in this beautiful mathematical universe and there's no connection to the world. Um, but we want to apply it to science. We want to apply it to the real world and science is in many results in science are intrinsically statistical or actuarial. So he set himself the task of working out how to go and do that. And the way he did that was he introduced this notion of a collective. So I'm going to, for those that like to read the maths, you can read the maths, um, or you can just listen to me and I'll sketch the idea of it. Um, so the idea is he's, he's trying to develop probability theory from something more fundamental. You imagine you've got an infinite sequence you get the relative frequencies of that. Keep in mind a, a sequence of coin toss, you're counting the fraction that are heads. And what, you what he introduces is the notion of a family of selection rules. I'll give you an example of this in a slide or two. A selection rule is a recipe for selecting sub-elements of the sequence. Maybe you take every odd numbered example, right? But you've got to go and fix them in advance. And for each selection rule, you can go and work out the relative frequencies of the subsequence that you get. So I have all of the coin tosses, I select all of the even numbered ones, I select all of the odd numbered ones, all of the prime numbered ones, I work out the relative frequencies for all of them. Okay, so it's like I've got this sequence here, um, the green and the blue dots, um, the green dots uh, select everything that's not green, the red dots are select everything that's not red, and then the idea is um, I'm just left with a smaller sequence. Right. They're removing, you're doing this on an infinite sequence, but I just wanted to kind of illustrate the idea. So he defines two axioms. He only needs two axioms, right, um, for his theory. And one of them is that the relative frequencies uh, have a limit, right? So you take the limit as the number of data points goes to infinity, and that limit exists. It doesn't have to. And then the second axiom is a little more complicated, but in words, it just says that if you do the same thing, for the relative frequencies on the subsequences, then one, they converge, and two, they converge to the same limit. So in the XKCD example, the first axiom might have prevailed, but the second one did not, right? Because when you select people who know that statistic, you get a different limiting frequency. So that was his point. So he calls sequences that satisfy those two conditions a collective, 
relative to the family curly S of selection rules. And um, collectives do exist, so you can prove that it's not a vacuous notion. And this RK is then the probability of K relative to the select set of selection rules in X. Um, axiom two, by the way, is called the law of excluded gambling systems. It's kind of obvious why would we call that. Now, crucially, this family must be family selection rules must be chosen in advance, right? And the, um, uh, this this whole scheme defines what a random sequence is relative to S. This is a really critical point. It is a relativized notion. So X. Your sequence, it can be random relative to one family of selection rules, but not random relative to some other family of selection rules. And there is no such thing as a truly random sequence. There's no absolute the probability. Many people are disappointed with this, I'm sure. Um, people have been trying to find the true notion. I don't believe it exists. I think his stuff is legitimate and it's a good way to, um, to move forward. So, with this machinery, von Mises actually derives the Kolmogorov axioms and notions such as independence from his theory of collectives. So the theory of collectives sits underneath probability theory, which sits underneath most of machine learning. So hence my interest um, in it. And this second axiom actually captures a very old idea. So one of the people that was uh, most famous for introducing the statistical way of thinking, particularly about people, was the Belgian astronomer Adolf Quetelet. And he, you know, he observed that um, you know, sometimes he didn't get the nice normal error curves that he liked because you could do this selection rule. Like you look at the distribution of heights of people and then you select the men and you select the women, you get different answers, right? It's, it's that simple. Now, this interestingly suggests a connection to ethical concerns, which are paramount nowadays in machine learning. Why? Well, if the distinction between these two groups is ethically laden, so von Mises' second axiom in fairness, right? Just think of this toy example. If the ML system concludes that redheads are more likely to do better at some job say than blondes, and you as a blonde haired person miss out, what exactly is your gripe, right? The challenge here is that you're mixing you as an individual from you of the class of people. That's why this thing is, is, is hard. Um, when Quetelet introduced this notion, people were very skeptical about the existence of these averages at all. They would make jokes about the, the man with 2.2 children, right? It doesn't, it, it, it's, it's kind of, it feels like a contradiction. Nowadays, most of the um, machinery, most of the fair machine learning literature takes for granted that moral harms occur when you have one of these inequities at the population level. So I think Unpicking this is, a, is a, still an open, an open question. My point here is simply to point out that the, um, this thing that von Mises introduced to base probability on, you can actually see ethical concerns baked in there. So you can go and say that uh, when you're going to apply this data about people, the ethical concerns are right there from the very outset. And this is in fact my path dependent way into this. Right, so the paper I did a couple of years ago on fairness risk measures, that's how I got into this topic. So if you're interested in that ethical side of things, you can go and take a look at that. So I see this as an opportunity because failures of the law of large numbers are failures of von Mises' axiom number one, and they're empirically not uncommon. You have to go looking for them, of course, because if you presume that your frequencies converge, you're never going to detect the failure of convergence. You'll just call it data set shift. There's this whole book by Gorbin that documents a whole bunch of examples where you don't get the relative frequencies converging. And a number of folks have worked on this. This fellow Ivanenko has, has done that. And without, I'm not giving any explanation as to why this is the case, but just to say that what the more sophisticated theory ends up doing is it replaces the expectation by the soup over some set of probability distributions of an expectation with respect to that. And interestingly, that notion, right, that yellow formula there has been reinvented independently about five times. In the literature, it's called robust Bayes, it's called lower and upper previsions, they're called Gilboa and Schmeidler maximum preferences in economics, and they're also related to things called choke weight capacities. So people keep reinventing it 
um, but it hasn't really had widespread traction yet. And interestingly, this notion, like Burrell's notion of what happens when things maybe do not converge, that you've got this non-stationarity, non-stationarity and this sort of soup of distributions amounts to being the same thing, right? And that's described in a paper that's going to be presented in 45 minutes at a conference by sheer coincidence, um, the bottom left there. So what do you do? What do you do in such a case? How do you proceed? How do you explore something other than expectation? You could say, well, we could try the medium, quantile, sums of quantiles. There's all sorts of things that you could go and try. And no, just picking a bunch of stuff and trying it out isn't going to do because you're going to have to justify it. I said that you need to be able to ethically justify your choice of expectation. So what can you do? Well, one way of proceeding, which I like, is you say, rather than trying to think of you know, an alternative choice, you say, well, let's think of all possible choices. Let's look at the structure of the space of all possible choices and think through the implications. Now, this has already been done to a degree. So there's this huge fat book on aggregation functions that Grabisch and others did. Um, they did it in a kind of a limited case to make the maths work uh, nicely. But, you know, it's, it's certainly a big inspiration and motivation for what I've been doing. And I just wanted to give you a flavor of that, um, of the sorts of what would a result look like here? Because this, for machine learning researchers, this is all a little bit strange, um, I think. It feels a bit strange to me. So how do you proceed? Well, what you do is you come up with a stack of axioms, right? Um, and this is an aesthetic choice. There's no one, there's no way to say whether an axiom is right or wrong. Um, it's, the proof is in the pudding. So many of these you can justify pretty easily. Some of them look kind of weird. I'm not going to try and show you the entire list, right? Just keep that in mind. Um, and all I'm going to do is to sketch out at warp speed um, an interesting implication that comes from a particular choice, right? It's just to show you the, the flavor of result that you can get. So I pick a particular uh, set of them, positive homogeneity, monotonicity, sub-additivity, agreement, non-triviality, and crucially, rearrangement invariance. Rearrangement invariance is the one that's doing all of the work here. That's essentially saying if these data points are about people, if you change the names of everybody, you get the same result, right? So it's like that ethical precept that everybody should be treated equally. We would like our aggregation function to have that property. What are the implications of doing that? So it turns out that there's a nice mathematical theory that you can lean upon. Um, and this slide's just for those that can parse the maths easily. So, um, so you work in a rather general setup in a, of, a, of a measure space. You have the idea of a distribution function. So if you think of a random variable and its distribution function, it's the same thing. It's the amount of time, as it were, that it takes on different values. It's, it's exactly the same idea. So, um, and then there's this notion of the decreasing rearrangement of a function. So the function now, remember that graph I showed you with all of the bars? Imagine that is now a potentially continuous function. So we don't restrict ourselves to the, to the discrete case. This is often the way you go to a more abstract setting, things become kind of clearer. And imagine sorting that in decreasing order, right? So you can always do that. I have a bunch of numbers, I sort them into decreasing order. This thing here is called the equally measurable rearrangement of a function. It's a continuous analog of sorting. And then there's this other function, which, you know, all you have to realize is that there's a way of defining it. It's called the maximal function. Okay. So I've got a distribution function. I've got F star and F double star. F star is the sorted version. And then what we're after effectively is coming up with a norm, a way of measuring the size of such a function with the property that it's rearrangement invariant. Namely, that if I have an F and a G, which might be different, but if when I sort them into a decreasing arrangement, then rho of um, F is equal to rho of G. So not all norms will have that property. It's a symmetry property, okay? So it turns out that if you have just that single extra property, then you can, um, uh, there's a lot of nice structure that you get. And in particular, there's this thing, it's called the fundamental function. It's essentially, imagine now a function that's uh, constant and then goes down to zero uh, for the rest of its uh, range. And so that's sort of like, um, if you're talking about people, you're saying this many people get $1,000, everybody else gets zero. 
right? And T is the fraction of people that get $1,000. And then what the fundamental function measures is uh, how bad you think that is, right? So um, if, you, you know, if you think that a small number of people getting a lot of money and everybody else getting not much at all is a bad thing, then you, you reflect that in the value that you've got. So it's, it's like a summary way. These norms are a complicated object. The fundamental function is, a part, is partial information about it. And I just need that to show you the flavor of one kind of result. And it turns out that this, this function has nice properties. It looks like the picture. That will do for the sake of the, the talk here. And it turns out that there's already some nice structure that people have figured out. So this goes back decades now, where you say, I want one of those norms. I want it to be a rearrangement invariant and I want to specify its fundamental function. Then what? Well, there's this nice answer, right? It turns out that it's sandwiched between these two norms, right? With these complicated looking names. The formulas don't particularly matter. Look at the thing in the bottom right corner, right? What it says is if you pick any norm with that fundamental function, it's sandwiched between the yellow and the green. Already, we know a lot about it. And interestingly, this, Lorentz norm, the thing, the, the, the lambda, is related to something else that is going to look less mysterious to you. So there's this thing called the conditional value at risk. So there's two equivalent definitions here. The intuitively easy one to understand is on the right hand side. So that's the expected value of a quantity conditioned on the quantity being bigger than the alpha quantile. So you've got a whole bunch of numbers. You take the chunk of them that are in the top quarter. Right, the height, the, peop, the top quartile, 25% of people who are the tallest, and you take the average of their height, right? That's C bar 0.75, right? So it turns out that machine learning researchers have been using this for ages without realizing it. It turns out that if you go and try and set up like a traditional regression problem and you replace expectation by C bar, then what you get is the new support vector machine. It's astonishing. This was worked out 12 years ago, not by me. Um, so this stuff is perhaps not so crazy after all. And then there's variations of this where you can um, you combine, you can have weighted combinations of quantiles. So you know, in the discrete case, I just add together a few different quantiles. That's called a spectral risk measure in finance. And it turns out that um, you know, when you connect that stuff, so this stuff about conditional value at risk and risk measures was developed in mathematical finance. The motivation was to ensure that the central banks of various nation states don't go bankrupt. That's, that was their motivation. It turns out that they reinvented something that the pure mathematicians had done 50 years earlier. So finding these kind of connections, I think, is, 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 is cool and a lot of fun. So these things, these Lorentz norms, turn out to be closely related to another notion that's widely used in machine learning. Well, not widely used, but it is used in machine learning. And here, I just show you the kind of thing that you would get. So if you just said, I'm going to work with probabilities, but I want to generalize it so that they're no longer additive, but they're, say, sub-additive. So if you know what that means, you end up with effectively a nonlinear notion of an integral. And that's called a choke integral. And I'm not going to walk through all of the um, uh, the, the, the formulas on the slide here, but for those that are interested, there's an intimate relationship between these risk measures and these capacities. And it's essentially, you know, it's the, it's the thing I, I said before, I can either work with our expectations or I can work with probabilities. Expectations are a functional, they eat a function and give you a number. Probabilities eat a set, right? They're a set function and they give you a number. So that you have to be able to translate backwards and forwards between them. And so um, the, the interesting connection to stuff that some of you might be aware of is in machine learning, there's a lot of interest in functions that are submodular. And there's two different notions of submodularity, one for set functions and one for functionals. And there's an intimate relationship with um, the, the stuff that I showed you before, right? So people like Francis Bach have been looking at these kinds of functions. So again, maybe not so weird after all. So fine, you've got this big family, um, but how do you choose, right? All I've said is that, you know, there's a largest and a smaller one, and there's actually an infinite number of them. This is the difficulty. Once you say that you're not gonna have expectation, there's a huge infinite number of choices. What are you going to do? So it turns out that, again, you can lean on the mathematicians, and there's a general way of dealing with this, 
where you say, if I've got two of these norms and I want to find another one that also has that property, it's an interpolation problem. So the way it's originally couched looks a little weird to a machine learning person, but effectively it's a way of guaranteeing that the thing in the middle does satisfy the equation in white and is a legitimate rearrangement invariant norm. Right? It's, this is not obvious. Like if I take you know, the median and this other quantile and I say I'm gonna combine them in some weird way, then how do I know that the thing that I've combined satisfies all of my axioms? So that's the game that one's playing. Anyway, it turns out, I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna skip the details on this and just get to the, um, just tell you this in words because I really like this result. This is why I, I, I rattled through all of that math so quickly. So you've got, you've, you, you, you accept that, okay, we might want to use something other than expectation. There's multiple motivations for doing that. I go and choose a particular way of measuring the size of things. Uli goes and chooses one. They're both legitimate, but we disagree, right? She thinks that, you know, you should look after the uh, poor people much more so than I, than I do, for example. So then we say, well, what are we going to do? We're going to try and split the difference somehow. So then we go meta and we say, well, what are all the ways that you could combine Uli's choice and Bob's choice? And it turns out that that family of choices is exactly the same as the family of choices that I had originally. So you can't solve this problem with a committee. That's my conclusion. You can't, you can't go saying that, well, um, I want to somehow avoid the complexity of this choice because the, 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 the degrees of freedom that you've got in originally choosing one of these functionals is exactly the same as the degrees of freedom that you've got in solving the meta problem and so on and so on and so on. You can keep going, right? So I thought that was kind of cool. So that's the end of the maths and I'm almost done. Um, uh, so I just wanted to, to kind of sum up this um, hyperspeed summary by saying a, a, a few more general points. So overall, one of the things I'm highly motivated here to do is to examine things that are taken for granted so much that it almost seems silly to challenge them, right? So for 30 years, I've just taken it as axiomatic, not to be questioned, that the way you measure the performance of the machine learning algorithm is the generalization error and the generalization error is the expected value. What else could it possibly be? So now I'm asking, well, what if it's not? A related, but something I don't have time to talk about at all, a related notion is when we think about data, that we think of it as a thing, right? It's, it's like an object. And furthermore, it's a fact and it's somehow given, right? Each of those you can challenge. Um, and I talked a little bit about that in a paper in the Harvard Data Science Review last year, if you want to look at that line. Both of these questions are actually deeply related. Um, another principle that I'm dead keen on is avoiding this notion that there's one right answer. So it's very interesting and liberating. There's only one expectation, but there's an uncountable infinity of these generalizations of it. This ridiculous looking word here, monocause ataxophilia, is the pathological desire for single cause explanations of anything, right? It was coined by the science fiction writer, Kim Stanley Robinson. It's one of my favorite words. Um, and, you know, in lots of contemporary areas of science, you see the same thing happening. You look at thermodynamics, for 100 years, people have been arguing, how can you get irreversibility at the macro level from reversible dynamics at the micro level? It's all mysterious. Well, when you go and look at the non-equilibrium situation, you realize that actually there's not only one entropy you need, there's an infinite family of them. And guess what? They are intimately related to the infinite family of expectations. So there's something very intriguing going on there. And the third big picture thing I wanted to get across was that I deliberately look outside for tools and methods. Um, so there's a vast amount of literature on machine learning now. I'm deliberately not looking at that so much, but I'm looking elsewhere. Um, because I think, you know, bringing, bringing those tools from a long way away into machine learning um, can be valuable quite apart from uh, what I'm doing. So final word as a research methodology, which I think is kind of funny. So here I am doing a bit of inductive reasoning. Um, in 1996, 
Um, I bought the book in blue there. You can read the full detailed story of this in the preface to Ingo Steinwart's book on support vector machines. He talks about it for several pages and I'll let you go and read it to see why he would do that, why, why it was significant that Bob bought this book. But I did, and I bought it from a London bookstore that I was just browsing in 1996. 14 years later, I was browsing in a different London bookstore and I bought this book simply for the same reason that I liked the title. The blue book, I thought, huh, entropy, that's cool. I'm into entropy. I didn't understand the book at all, but I thought I'd buy it anyway. Non-stochastic randomness, I thought, that's an oxymoron. What could that possibly mean? Anyway, after nine years, I finally read it and it's, the, it's part of the basis of what I'm doing now. So my prediction is that I will go to London in 2026 and buy a green book on something. <laughs> I, just, I don't know what that's going to be. Um, thank you very much.